Uh, my name's Martin Lauder and I work for a charity called Global Action Plan, um, which some of you might have heard of. Uh, for us, um, all of the programmes we run, it's about making the link between what's good for people and what's good for the planet. Um, so at the moment, our portfolio stretches across looking at um, consumerism and well-being, um, making connections between the stuff people buy and kind of their, their mental well-being. And that's kind of, if you think of the reduce, reuse, recycle bit at the bottom of how we use the resources on the planet, actually going back to the very top and starting thinking about how you and when you access stuff before worrying about what to do with it afterwards is a, a really important area. Uh, the second part of our work stream is, is really with schools and with young people. We do a lot of workshops um, on topics that vary through water, waste, energy, air pollution, the whole spectrum. Uh, and then thirdly uh, and finally, uh, air pollution, clean air is our third area that we work on. Uh, it's the one that uh, I head up uh, in our air quality team and I think it's the most important, I think it's the most tangible. Um, we've heard this morning already uh, about the links to, to asthma, respiratory uh, problems, and that actually um, air pollution can be solved instantaneously. It's generated here and now by cars out on the street, by factories around the corner. If they stop straight away, the air quality would improve. And I think that gives a sign for hope that if we change our behavior, uh, take different actions if you like we will instantaneously see an improvement in air quality so that's what I want to think about today um, our flagship air quality program uh, is is one called clean air day um, quick show of hands has anyone here heard of clean air day before okay yes five or six or seven that's good that's good uh, for those of you that don't know uh, clean air day uh, it was on June the 21st this year, it was the uh, third year that we've run the program, um, and it will be June 18th in 2020. And it is the, the UK's largest public-facing uh, engagement program that talks about air pollution. Not just air pollution, but it's about inspiring action to do two things. Firstly, it's about giving people the knowledge so that they can um, uh, the actions they can, can take can reduce their contribution to air pollution. So by not getting in the car, they are avoiding that pollution that's going out into the atmosphere. Uh, but the second important thing here is what people can do to reduce their exposure to air pollution. So we've heard taking side streets, getting on a bike, um, and it's about marrying those two up and explaining and, and providing people with the confidence and the knowledge so that they can go ahead and carry out these behaviours in their day-to-day -day life. Um, so the reason I'm here today is that um, we are working with the CCG at the moment um, about trying to uh, reduce the collective aim of reducing the number of respiratory and asthma cases that uh, the borough have to deal with. And so air pollution is one of the areas that affects asthma, so that's what we want to do and take a look at today. Um, we are designing a program at the moment uh, where we will develop training and resources to clinicians like yourself so that you can go ahead and provide that clear information to your patients, uh, in particularly vulnerable groups such as children. And so at the end of this session and, and over lunch, um, you'll find me set up on one of the tables with examples of various resources that we've got designed up. And I'd love it for you to come and give me your feedback into what works for you? Could you see yourselves talking to people about this information? We'll go away, um, finalise it and be able to pr provide you with, um, I suppose, uh, a, a, a polished version of these resources. OK. Um, right. Uh, so I've got some facts for you, some of which have already gone in the last presentation. So uh, we'll maybe test you on how well you were listening. Um, but and the wider UK population, uh, so air pollution causes up to 36,000 deaths per year in the UK. Uh, air pollution causes over 6 million sick days per year in the UK. That's not just one person, that's collectively across, across the country. Um, <laughs> uh, air pollution has an estimated total social cost of just over £22 billion. So, 
to put that in perspective, that's up there with, with cancer, it's up there with obesity, you know, it really is a massive public health issue. And it's not just an environmental issue. I think you'll agree with me that when we hear about air pollution in the news at the moment, it's talking about the impact on health. And that's really important, and which is why we're here today. Um, and then you can see air pollution causes over 20,000 respiratory and cardiovascular hospital emissions a year in the UK. So the aim really here is to reduce that number, which we'd all agree. Um, so air pollution is the air that we breathe in. Um, what I would say, and building on what we've heard from this morning, is that air pollution affects you from your first breath to your last. And actually, uh, it affects you before your first breath. Um, there are multiple studies at the moment that show links to uh, low birth weight uh, and, and kind of that's just the tip of the iceberg if you like. Um, uh, a story I like to tell is I think it was 2008 there was an Olympics in Beijing and uh, Beijing realized that the world's eyes were going to be on Beijing. They have a very polluted city so they thought right for the next few months we're going to have to we're going to have to do something to clean up our air to make it more appealing to everybody visiting for the Olympics. So they put a few different measures in place. Uh, they built um, lots of car-free streets around the city. They alternated between, um, uh, if your number plate ended in a certain number, you could drive it half of the week. And then if it was the other number, you'd be able to drive it the other half of the week. So they did various things and they brought the air pollution down. Um, a study was uh, taking place at the same time that was looking into the birth weight of children being born across Beijing. And what they discovered was if you were born during the Olympics in Beijing, you actually weighed more than before and after because the air was cleaner. And I think that is quite a scary fact. Um, and, and that's just one of multiple studies out there um, that kind of amaze me on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so we've spoken about the uh, air pollution, it's all about the particles that we breathe in into our body. Um, we've also said that um, any amount of air pollution can be damaging. Uh, those who are the most vulnerable, unfortunately, um, uh, are, are, are the most vulnerable. So I suppose one of the key points here is, and we've spoken about this beforehand, is generally the smaller the particle, the more damaging it's going to do to your health. So it will get inside your bloodstream, it will get inside into your cardiovascular, into your lungs. And going back to that mask conversation, uh, the ones that we are really concerned about are the tiny, tiny ones, which, maths, uh, which the masks and air purifiers aren't as good at tackling. Um, we spoke again about children. Uh, so we did a study that showed that actually on the walk to school, children are exposed to 30% more air pollution than the adults that are holding their hands for the reasons of them being next to the exhaust, next to the street. So I won't stay uh, too much on that point. Uh, again, because of their size, uh, car exhaust, of course. Um, again, going back to for children who are already that have asthma and exposed to more air pollution can increase how bad their symptoms are. Uh, and I suppose what's interesting is the difference between the, the, the chronic asthma um, Ooh. Thank you. There you go. Cheers. Um, I suppose the difference between the acute and the chronic asthma, so the short term and the long term, uh, the solutions that we've got and I'll take you through will benefit both scenarios. Um, students in Tower Hamlets have a 10% reduced lung capacity than the rest of the UK. But I've got some more for you. Um, so. 40% uh, of residents in the borough are in areas that exceed legal air pollution, safe uh, legal air pollution levels. Uh, 37 primary schools and 11 secondary schools located in the borough have unacceptable air, air levels of air pollution. Um, and a, a fact here that was taken from research that we did uh, not within, uh, oh, yes, within Tower Hamlets was the, the London Marathon. Uh, can I have some guesses from, from you guys at what drop uh, as a percentage do you think in terms of the pollution that dropped in the London Marathon resulted as the roads being closed? So we had monitors along the marathon and there was a reduction of what percent because there were no vehicles on the road? What do you reckon? Hands up. 
Ten percent. Higher. Higher. Eighty-nine percent reduction. Um, and that's on one day, just because there were no cars on those roads. So it does just show you that the problem in this scenario is essentially the car and the modal shift, the importance of getting people out of the car and scooting, cycling, walking. It really is the kind of the blue, it's, it's the perfect scenario because not only are you not producing the air pollution, but we've discovered from some of the um, uh, experiments we've spoken about that actually your exposure is higher in a car as well. So you start thinking to yourself, why am I driving? You know, what benefit am I doing to the health, not just my health, but the health uh, of the family and you know, the kids on the commute? So um, yeah, something to, to have a think about. Uh, moving on, what have we got next? Right, yes, uh, so as I said, uh, we have our resources that you're welcome to come and find me and comment on afterwards. At the moment, we've got five behaviours that we will advise that we talk to people about. And I'll go into a little bit of detail about each one. Uh, so, discover the side streets. Again, we've spoken about this. Uh, some research indicates that between 20 and 30% uh, are the numbers that you can reduce your exposure by, by just taking that side street, going around the main road. Um, the numbers speak for themselves. It might take a little bit longer, um, but generally it's a much more pleasant experience. Now, if you suffer from asthma or any other respiratory condition, then you have to consider it's more than just the 20 and 30% that you're reducing your exposure to, because actually what's going to trigger and make those episodes worse is this as well. So it is, again, win-win. Uh, the second one, yeah, so leave the car behind. Uh, being stuck in traffic can expose people to lots of air pollution. Um, you know, there, there are solutions such as, well, when you are in a car and, and you know, you've got your engine, you've got your filter coming in in front of you, the filter of the car is exactly behind the exhaust pipe of the car in front. So all that car's doing is just sucking in air from the dirty exhaust pipe from the car in front. Now, there are things you can do with the filter buttons on the cars, and you can ideally, uh, when you're out in the countryside, yes, by all means, bring in clean air. When you get into city centres, close the filter so that the car's just kind of recirculating the same air. But again, you know, it's not the best solution because the car in itself, you know, getting rid of that is, is the dream in this scenario. Um, yep. What have we got next? Uh, okay, so checking the forecast. We've spoken about this. Um, what's unique about the program that we're discussing at the moment is that we're trying to benefit those who are most vulnerable. And so if they are able to get to work at a different time or go to the shops at a different time, when you're talking to, to your patients, reminding them that they have choices about when and where they go, and so even signing up to alerts and looking at the forecast means that they can change what they're doing on certain days depending on how high the forecast is, essentially. Uh, AirText was mentioned. Um, they do send you a message to your mobile phone that tells you, I think it's, it's a low, high, or medium uh, uh, levels of expected air pollution, um, which is great. Turning off the engine, uh, we've already had that debate about electric cars uh, against regular cars uh, and which is better. Uh, yes, they both have the um, pollutants given off by brake wear and tear. Um, I would also consider that a big part of, of behaviour change, which is essentially what we're trying to do here, getting people to change their behaviour from one thing to another, you need an understanding of where that person is at at the moment. So you need to know what motivates them. In this case, health is generally a really good uh, indicator. So talking about the benefits to their health, talking about any cost savings. As again, there are more weapons in your arsenal when you're communicating to someone about how to get them to do what you want to do. Um, but you also have to consider the, the position that, that someone is in. And I'm aware that advising people to buy an electric car, for example, um, can be fairly expensive. So 
when you're talking to your patients and you have a gauge for kind of where they are in their lives and the behaviours that we list out on our resources will be for you to pick which one you feel is best for the people that you're talking to, that's what I'm trying to say. Um, and generally, just a top tip, uh, on idling, um, you will see at the moment that uh, lots of schools uh, are really trying to uh, clamp down on the school drop-off where you have those idling engines pulling up outside the school. Um, the general rule is about a minute. So if you're in a car for less than a minute and you know you're going to be moving on, better to keep the engine on. If you're going to be in the car for a minute or longer and you're aware of this, it's better to switch the engine off. Uh, next up, um, so we don't often talk about indoor air pollution in the same context we talk about outdoor air pollution. Um, I know from my own experience when I first got involved in our air pollution programs, I think, yeah, cars, transport, factories, you know, I, I can picture all these sources of outdoor air pollution, but indoor was a little bit harder for me to, to, to understand. And I think what's crucial is if you, th you think of your day today, what percentage of your day have you spent inside or will you spend inside? Um, maybe 80 percent, maybe higher. And so indoor air pollution is something that we need to talk about. And there's lots of things that contribute to indoor air pollution. Um, everything from your Febreze or your air fresh, if you're trying to make the room smell nicer, right through to heating or cooking. If you've got a gas stove and you can smell something burning, obviously that's contributing to indoor air pollution. Um, but what people don't tend to realize is also things like varnishes um, and the paints that you use. And you know when you buy, a, you, you might buy like a new pillowcase or a new duvet and you open it up and you smell and that hits you. That's, that's pretty, pretty toxic. And a story I like to, to tell is um, if, you've, if, you know, if you're talking to someone that's got a newborn and they've done their best to pick the best room at the front of the house that's south facing, it's got all the sunlight coming into it and they're bringing their baby into this new room and what they've done is they've created a very toxic environment because they've just painted all of the walls in the, in the bedroom so it's giving off all of the toxins. They've got these brand new duvets and pillowcases and they're like best ever but again they've kind of got that amaldehyde that's coming straight off uh, and then types of processed woods as well are also giving off uh, VOCs, uh, volatile, volatile organic compounds. And so you, you're putting your newborn loved one into a situation that you wouldn't do in any other example, but it's because people are lacking the knowledge in which the situation finds itself. And a key solution in terms of indoor air pollution is ventilation. Um, as, a, as the golden rule, ventilation is generally a good thing. If you're facing a very busy street and it's rush hour, and you know there's lots of fumes outside. In that example, it's good to shut the window, let the air outside stay outside, you stay with what you got. But then later on in the day when it's less busy and you want to ventilate your room, that's when you open and you let everything through. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to share some insights on that. Um, and then, I won't spend too long on this, but these are some of the examples of resources that we're thinking of, of providing. Um, we've already spoken about language barriers today and possibly the benefit of using images in our materials because that you know, image says a thousand words. Um, and then on the one side, having an asthma air pollution plan where, as I said, depending on the individual's circumstance, you would decide which of the behaviours are most beneficial to that patient. Um, so please come and grab me at lunch. Um, I'll be sticking around with some post-its and you can write your ideas. Uh, one final point is at what moment in the care pathway you think this information would be most useful as well. So any insight you have to that would be wonderful. Um, that's it from me.